Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 436th episode, we have a bunch of news, including some April tomfoolery. Yep. <laughs> Because it's our April Fool's episode, even though it's a few days late. Yeah. I mean, it's not really, we're not going to like trick anybody with fake news or anything like that. No. But last year's episode, which was 383, we did tease it by talking about the dodo bird. Yes. And I guess it's kind of becoming a tradition that we talk about birds. <laughs> well. <laughs> which are dinosaurs. At least this year. Plus, we had some suggestions that I couldn't pass up. Yeah. Yeah. And there were some dinosaur related, like bird like dinosaurs and things like that, and early birds that were actually dinosaurs, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we lumped it together for our April Fools episode. April Fools ish. <laughs> April Fools adjacent. <laughs> and of course, we have a dinosaur of the day, Ornithomimus. Mm -hmm. This is another one. I had to double check. I was like, is this a redo of an earlier Dinosaur of the Day? Nope. Just took us a while to get to. 436 episodes before we got to Ornithomimus. Yeah. It's a bird-like one. It is. Fits I just, the theme. I can't believe it took us that long to get to it. It's very surprising. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a well-known, like when we went through all the dinosaurs that were in Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. I guess Ornithomimus wasn't in there. They had Gallimimus. Yeah. It's just surprising. And of course, we have a fun fact. Which may, in fact, involve birds, but has a dinosaur connection. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> but before we get into all of that, as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank three new patrons. And they are Hertian, Tyrannosaurus, emphasis on the Ann, mm. and Karen. Thank you all very much for joining. We've been getting slightly less advertising than usual, so everybody who joins really helps us oh, yeah. with our mission of spreading paleontology and science and dinosaur enjoyment all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for joining. And rounding out our shout outs, we have John Heck, David, Robert, Daniel McGill, Quadrosaurus, Seamus B, and George. Yes, thank you so much. As Garrett mentioned, without your support, we could not keep doing this show. So we really appreciate you. And before we jump into the news, I just want to quickly mention that we were recently on the What the If podcast. It's a show where they take a topic or a question and kind of think, like, what are the details? What would happen if this happened? And so we had a lot of fun. We talked about what if you were the chief resident at a dinosaur hospital? Because, you know, we love talking about pathologies. <laughs> Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We were trying to come up with a way to connect dinosaurs to a hypothetical situation. And the idea of how you would treat all these dinosaurs with different injuries we know they had was a lot of fun. Jumping into the news, kicking it off with our first bird adjacent dinosaur paper. This one was published in Zoological Letters and written by Eureka Uno and Tatsuya Hirasawa. And it's an update on how dinosaurs became birds. Back in our 390th episode, it was titled How Dinosaurs Evolved Flight. And we talked a lot about wings and how they're as much about propulsion as they are about creating lift and the importance of the leading edge of the wing and the asymmetric feather and how it deforms less and therefore leads to more stable flight. And as one of our most popular episodes of all time, which kind of surprised me. And I guess that means we need to talk about birds more, or at least bird-like dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> that was your takeaway. Yeah. All right. Well, people clearly liked it. And then Science News published a press release titled How Birds Got Their Wings, which is very similar to How Dinosaurs Evolved Flight. Mm -hmm. So I knew this story was going to be worth sharing. Plus, I guess we've started this tradition of talking about birds on April Fool's Day, so it all worked out. Yeah. We'll see if we remember this tradition next year. Yeah, that's true. I always have grand intentions like every World Metrology Day to mention <laughs> some sort of weird unit in some years I miss it. But this new article looks at the area of the wing that's called the propatagium. And the origin of the propatagium has been a mystery. There have been some inferences on when it might have been, but we don't know exactly when it evolved. Mm-hmm. I'm going to attempt to explain what the propatagium is. That was going to be my question. <laughs> if you bend your arm 
with your elbow at a 90 degree angle. So if you put it out to your side and you have your arm at a 90 degree angle and sort of in a position like you're doing a curl, you know, so your arm is like half bent, Mm -hmm. half the way up. In that position, your arm is making a sort of V shape. Yeah. From the wrist to the elbow and then the elbow to the shoulder, the two sides of the V. I'm looking at your arm right now. Yeah, that's a V shape. (laughs) So birds can do this just like us. They have the same bones in their arms basically that we do and their hands for that matter. You just might not notice because of all the feathers. Yes, and the propatagium. And to go along with those same bones, birds also have very similar muscles. They have biceps and triceps, just like we do on the upper arm. They also have similar muscles on their forearms. But with birds, they have a muscle that we do not have. And with your arm in that V shape, where it is, is it connects directly from their shoulder to their wrist. Oh. So it's making up another side of a triangle. It's now gone from a V shape to basically a triangle shape Hmm. with those points connected. That muscle that connects the shoulder to the wrist is called the propatagialis. And now that upper arm, lower arm, and propatagialis are the three sides of a triangle. And birds have skin that covers that propatagialis at the top and then the arm down below. So it's making this triangular surface of skin. That surface of skin, that area, that triangle is called the propatagium. Okay. So that's the propatagium. And we're trying to figure out where it came from because it's really important. It's the leading edge of the wing when birds are flying. So if you imagine if your head is going face first into wind and your feet are out behind you and you have your arms in that V shape, Mm -hmm. that area between your hand and your shoulder is the very first thing that the air is going to touch. So if it's angled down or up, if it's a little bit looser or held more taut, that's all going to affect how you fly in, in a very important way, similar to how the importance of those asymmetric feathers not distorting on the leading edge of the wing are really important. But the really big question is, how does something weird like this evolve and when did it evolve? Because you could imagine it's a muscle connecting the wrist to the shoulder. How does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> it's very strange. And unfortunately, because soft tissue rarely preserves, the researchers have to come up with a different indicator for the propatagium rather than just looking for it in the fossil record. So if you think about it, if there's a muscle between the wrist and the shoulder, it basically holds their arm in a rough V shape. Mm -hmm. Because if all of a sudden your wrist is connected to your shoulder, you can't straighten your arm all the way. (laughs) You could, but something might tear. Yes, exactly. A lot of muscles can't double their length, for example. So it could be trouble. And it depends on the bird. They have Some of them are really tendinous and tough, and other ones are more like muscles. So there is a range of how much they be, could straighten them. But of course, the relaxed position is the most relevant one for fossilization. And if they have to exert energy to straighten their arms and stretch the propatagium, obviously when they're dead, it's going to relax back and their arms are going to be back in that V shape if they have a propatagium. So ideally, you might see where this is going, we can look at a whole bunch of fossils and we can determine which dinosaurs first had a propatagium by these angles. If they have Vs Mm. going with both of their arms or if their arms are straight, Mm -hmm. you know, very different answer. And that can tell you approximately when this evolved. Yes. So I really like this paper because for once the statistics look very good. There's very little overlap between birds and non-dinosaur reptiles with their fossilized elbow angles. So a typical angle for a reptile arm is 140 degrees. This is like the elbow angle. Mm -hmm. Since a straight line, you may remember from math class, is 180 degrees, it's nearly straight. It's a, a pretty straight limb at that point. It's only 40 degrees away from straight. On the other hand, modern birds are only 31 degree angles. Oh. So it's a pretty tight V, 150 degrees away from straight, in other words. So it's, it's a very big difference. The Mesozoic bird ancestors to modern birds and enantiornithines are at 32 degrees, basically the same as modern birds. Mm-hmm. The early avialans that include Archaeopteryx, Anchiornis, and others are at about 38 degrees. The more basal paraves, including E. chi, Microraptor, and Scansoriopteryx, were at about 36 degrees. And then one notch higher at basal Manoraptorins, which include Caudipteryx, Chidipati, and Ovaraptor, are at about 85 degrees. 
which is pretty similar to other dinosaurs. Hmm. Once you get outside of that group and to the, you know, the other main group of dinosaurs, you get to about 90 degrees. Things like Struthiomimus are just outside Manoraptora, and that one actually has a relatively straight arm too. And this means that just like its namesake, Struthio, aka the ostrich, Struthiomimus also doesn't have a propatagium. Oh, so it is even more ostrich-like. Yeah. It doesn't mean its arms weren't totally covered in feathers, because obviously ostriches are. But ostrich ancestors apparently lost their propatagium at some point after they stopped flying. Oh, makes sense. Maybe it's nice to be able to stretch those arms out. Yeah. (laughs) If you're not using that propatagium for flight. The surprising group for me in this list were the basal manoraptorans, again, Caudipteryx, Chidipati, and Ovaraptor with that 85 degree angle. It seems that at least some of them have a propatagium. It's possible that their propatagialis muscle just wasn't very strong, so it didn't pull the elbow angle in as much Mm -hmm. because it's only like five degrees off from most other dinosaurs, but maybe it's just like, oh, that was the very beginnings of it. Yeah. So it just wasn't pulling that hard on the, the wrist. Caudipteryx, though, has what looks like soft tissue in a fossil. There's a a very rare specimen that has what looks like a propatagium, and its elbow is sort of in between that non-avian dinosaur terrestrial pre-bird group versus the later crown birds. So it's a bit of an oddball, but it is very far from looking like something that can fly. Caudipteryx basically looks like a small gallimimus or ornithomimus, if you prefer, mm-hmm. since we're talking about that later. And it looks much more like, yeah, those or struthiomimus than Archaeopteryx. In fact, I think its arms might even be proportionately smaller to its body than struthiomimus. Oh. So it's interesting. It has these smaller arms, but has that propatagium, which you'd think would be used for flight. Right. Something weird is going on with Caudipteryx. <laughs> it's called evolution. Yep. Assuming that Caudipteryx had a propatagium, That would make it very likely that the propatagium evolved in early Manoraptorans. That would go all the way back to the middle Jurassic, a little bit before Archaeopteryx, which is in that group. Hmm. Unfortunately, though, they didn't look at any larger Dromaeosaurids in the study. Future studies. Yeah, maybe. I would have really liked to see where Velociraptor and Troodontids came out. They were in these groups. They just didn't include them in their analysis, which I think is unfortunate because at the very least... For people doing paleo art, it would be nice to know. Mm. A lot of people assume that they had a propatagium. And if this is the case that a basal manoraptorin happened to have a propatagium, they likely would have. But since we were talking about stuff like ostriches that lost it, you know, it's possible that Velociraptor, one of the dromaeosaurs, might have lost it as well. It's not mentioned in the paper, but in the supplementary material, you can see that Mwebasaurus also has a narrow elbow angle. It's a close relative of Struthiomimus and just outside of Manoraptora. So that could mean that the propatagium evolved before Manoraptora if it's a convergent thing. And it turns out that Webasaurus actually does have a propatagium. Interestingly, even in groups where the elbow joints were consistently small, the wrist joints were all over the place. The only reason I bring this up is because other researchers have looked for wrist angles in fossilization Mm -hmm. for an indication of when wrists evolved the ability to bend extra so that dinosaurs evolving into birds could fold their wings. Mm. So it's been sort of inferred like, oh, well, they needed to fold their wings. So if the wrists were really flexible, that shows you that these were birds folding wings and not just moving their hands. But since it seems like the propatagium and that elbow angle came first, it might mean that some dinosaurs were still able to use their hands for grabbing things rather than folding a wing-like structure, but they still had a propatagium, which would give a good explanation for Caudipteryx, which clearly isn't flying anywhere with its little arms, but maybe it got some benefit from its propatagium in a display structure or, or who knows what. One of the many hypotheses for flying wing assisted incline running trees down ground up one of these things maybe it needed a propatagium for that but still wasn't quite fully winged so that's one more piece in the puzzle and how dinosaurs have all flight and where birds fit in and real quick we're going to pause for a brief sponsor break but when we get back sabrina's going to tell me all about a new sauropod paper well 
That's a little misleading, but maybe it goes with our April Fool's theme. (laughs) All right, next up, I wanted to talk about this really fun paper. It's an open access paper, and it's about the one and only concrete cast of the Diplodocus from the Carnegie Museum, which it's a great story. I recommend reading the full thing if you want all the details. I'm just going to get into a short-ish summary. It was written by Michael Taylor and others. That's Mike from SV Pow, if you know that blog. They're sore pot people. The paper's called The Concrete Diplodocus of Vernal, a Cultural Icon of Utah. And this was published in the Geology of the Intermountain West. Again, open access. So this concrete skeleton was first unveiled in Vernal, Utah in 1957. And it was outside the museum, the field museum there, for three decades. Oh, wow. When you said it was a sauropod concrete dinosaur outside, I was thinking of that pink one they have. Mm. I'm not sure if that's a sauropod. I think that's a sauropod. It is, but that's a more cartoony (laughs) sauropod. It's not the Carnegie one. (laughs) Yeah. Meaning it's not dippy. Gotcha. Yeah. And I I misspoke. It's the Utah Fieldhouse of Natural History State Park Museum, which we did visit, Garrett, back in 2013. And, well, we didn't see the concrete cast, but we did see the second generation lightweight cast that was made from molds. And that's the one that's inside the museum and the, well, I guess it is dippy. Seems like it's looking at you. I don't remember the looking at you part. I do remember that they had a large outdoor area with tons of dinosaur sculptures, which I assume is where the concrete one used to be. I think so. There's a lot of good pictures of it from over the years. In the publication, there's a couple black and white photos from 1957 when they were preparing and assembling the Diplodocus. Then there's this undated outdoor mount, but it's in color. So yeah, you could probably figure out whereabouts it used to stand. And then in the paper, there's a couple of good quotes that I wanted to read off, starting with, quote, The concrete Diplodocus of Vernal has become one of the most influential of all Diplodocus specimens, second only to the Carnegie original. Hmm. I don't know about the Dippy fans in the UK, what they would think of that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, the authors also wrote, quote, the Diplodocus skeleton known by the rather inelegant nickname Dippy. So they're not a fan of the name Dippy. Wow. <laughs> I thought that was funny. A couple quick definitions before I go into more detail on this paper. So a mold is a structure where the spaces inside the mold match the shape of the dinosaur. And then you've got a cast where you make the cast by filling the mold and then the shape of the cast matches the shape of the dinosaur. Yeah. So in other words, a, a mold is sort of like a negative. Mm-hmm. It's the the absence of it is where the dinosaur would be and the cast is the replica. Mm-hmm. Now, in the late 1800s, Andrew Carnegie or Carnegie was inspired by a newspaper article to, quote, ask the director of the museum that bears his name to obtain a giant dinosaur skeleton for exhibit, which I didn't realize. That's where it all started. Yeah. In 1899, the holotype of Diplodocus Carnegie was found in Albany County in Wyoming, and then it was described by John Bell Hatcher in a monograph in 1901, and their Diplodocus was mounted in the Carnegie Museum in 1907. There were some missing bones that came from a second specimen or individual and then casts and sculptures based on other close relatives. That's how they made their complete cast. That's where Dippy came from. Yes, but Dippy was mounted earlier. So King Edward VII of England asked Andrew Carnegie for a diplodocus skeleton for the museum in England. And he, Carnegie, agreed to sending a cast because that was faster than finding a second diplodocus (laughs) skeleton. That's the reason. That's funny. Yeah. And Dippy was unveiled two years earlier in 1905 at the British Museum, now the Natural History Museum in London. Yeah, the most people think of when they think of Dippy, Mm -hmm. the one that's nicknamed that formerly in the British Museum, now who knows where, (laughs) on tour. (laughs) Uh, The tour has ended, but I think Dippy's got like a three-year stay somewhere. Yeah. They also made four additional casts that Carnegie gifted to the leaders of that time of Germany, France, Austria, and Italy. Um, He gifted them between 1908 and 1909. And then he authorized making five more casts, and he donated three, one to Argentina, one to Spain, one to Russia. All of these gifts he gave in hopes of preventing war. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. He's trying to do a little bit of diplomacy via dippy gifts. Yeah, (laughs) via dinosaurs. 
But then World War One happened starting in 1914. So I guess it wasn't enough. Yeah. There was more going on than just dinosaurs. Yeah. Carnegie himself died in 1919. So there were two casts left. And after he died, the museum was in trouble financially. Eventually, Lois's wife sent the two casts to Mexico City, one in 1930, and then to Munich in 1934, although the one in Munich was never mounted. And then after this, the molds were forgotten in the museum's basement for over 40 years. The one in Munich? No, the molds for making Dippy oh, in the gotcha. Carnegie Museum. You just explained the difference between molds and casts, and I already <laughs> mixing it up. <laughs> so, moving over into Utah... Vernal, Utah is only 20 miles away from the Carnegie Quarry and Dinosaur National Monument. All the fossils excavated there were for a while being sent back to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to the Carnegie Museum. Makes sense. But in Utah, you know, they liked having their fossils. And so Utah Fieldhouse was built to help with tourism. That was built in 1948. Oh, that's older than I expected. They must have rebuilt it at some point. Yes, they have. Leroy... Pop K, who worked at the Carnegie Quarry, ended up working at the Carnegie Museum. In 1952, the Carnegie Museum director wanted to purge some of their dinosaur material because he thought it took up too much storage space. Yeah. What kind (laughs) of? They ended up only removing duplicate specimens, which included the molds for the Diplodocus cast. I'm still outraged by this. Well, (laughs) Kay was close to retiring at this point and planning to move back to Vernal, Utah. So he wanted the molds to find a home in Utah and he gifted them to the field house as long as the field house arranged transporting them because those molds weighed five tons. (laughs) <laughs> that's not, that's a it's a gift with a big asterisk. <laughs> well, it also turns out that the molds weren't in the best shape at this point and needed some repairing. Here, have a five ton mold that's broken. <laughs> well, Yay! Like, I wouldn't say broken, but <laughs> yeah. The other kind of issue here was the Diplodocus skeleton was seventy six feet long, and the field house only had a fifty foot long exhibit hall. Mm. So that's how it ended up. Their Diplodocus was outside the museum. Outside of the museum, there can be some extreme temperatures of negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So they needed something that was more robust than plaster. And that's how they decided to make it out of concrete. That's very interesting. I didn't know it got down to negative 40 in Vernal. I didn't either. The 100 doesn't surprise me. Yeah. High altitudes and all that deserty sort of environment. But this is just like the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, too, because it's the outdoor concrete sculptures. Yeah, it's got to withstand a lot of things. About 100 years later. (laughs) So the concrete cast is about 600 pieces. Some of the vertebrae were made from eight or more pieces. They used wire and rods to reinforce it, and then they coated the bones, the cast bones, in fiberglass. Then they mounted the skeleton on steel scaffolding and reinforced it so it could withstand 70 mile per hour winds that the same winds that uprooted nearby trees. (laughs) That's impressive. Yeah, the whole thing weighed eight tons. They unveiled this cast in 1957. It took them about a year and a half to create. It cost $10,000, which I liked at the paper said that's over $105,000 in 2022. And this cast stood outside for 32 years. It's unclear, unfortunately, what happened to those original molds after they made this cast. Oh, bummer. Now, by the late... 1980s, their concrete cast was deteriorating. These things need maintenance, if there's anything we've learned from Crystal Palace. Keep it painted. Mm. The paint is what saves all outdoor things from decay. (laughs) (laughs) The museum also wanted, in Utah, wanted to have a new lightweight Diplodocus cast to put inside. They decided this time they would curve the tail so it could fit in their 50-foot long exhibit room. Okay. So a new one was made after they cleaned and prepared the concrete cast, because they had to do that in order to make new molds, because we lost the original molds. And that, they ended up working with some partners, and it was delivered to the museum in 1991. And there's a lot of details I left out there, but again, you can read the full paper. However, it took until 1994 to fully mount. It ended up mostly being pieced together by one employee, who also had other responsibilities, so he could only work on it when he had free time. Plus, he had to learn some new skills to mount the skeleton. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. 
Then the museum moved to a larger building in 2004, and the Diplodocus was moved to the entrance of the new museum, which is the one we saw. The concrete cast was also returned to the Utah Fieldhouse. Again, they worked with partners to do this, but the scaffolding had to be cut to take the cast down so they couldn't remount the concrete cast, Hmm. and it ended up in storage. So all the pieces are still there, they just don't have it up. Yes. Although the femora was left outside the building in this dino dig area, (laughs) but it's not there now. Eventually, the concrete cast went on loan on this 99-year renewable loan to USU Eastern Prehistoric Museum in Price, Utah. So it's there now, but it hasn't yet been remounted because they're waiting for a new building for the museum. You need a lot of space for these sauropods indoors. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) More casts, though, have been made since of the Diplodocus. There are new molds that have been used to make more of these casts, and these casts are now mounted in Japan and other places, and the casts have been used to help fill in missing parts of the Barasaur skeleton at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. So there's casts of this holotype all over the world, and in the paper they said, quote, as a result, this individual became and remains the single best known dinosaur in the world, end quote. Yeah, it was uh, growing up, I always thought T-Rex was the most well-known, but mm-hmm. I think for a lot of Europeans, especially especially British people, Dippy is like the one that everybody knows. I mean, sauropods are great. <laughs> 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 a lot of these casts are made in plaster, all the oldest ones are, and the newer ones, many of them are made with water-expanded polyester, so they're even more lightweight. And the paper ends with, you know, this is important to know. It's significant historically and scientifically on how and when casts are made. And, you know, it's so easy for things to get lost, like how we don't know what happened to those original molds. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that they made a mold of a cast. So it's like making a photocopy of a photocopy. Mm -hmm. You do start to lose some detail if you do that too much. But make do with what you have. Yeah. Okay, moving on. At the beginning of this episode, we mentioned we got some pretty great suggestions last year for April Fool's episodes, which I've just hung on to for about a year now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I've got a, for lack of a better term, an April Fool's section of the show. I'll start with this one from Kessler, who suggested Thesaurus. And for that one, I found two good jokes. I guess they're kind of like dad jokes Mm -hmm. or mom jokes, you know, however you want to put it. Moms can make corny jokes too. Sure can. (laughs) All right. Scientists recently discovered a new dinosaur that was very intelligent. They named it Thesaurus. (laughs) And you can probably guess the answer to this next one, Garrett. What do you call a dinosaur with a strong vocabulary? The same answer. Sure is. (laughs) Thesaurus. (laughs) Yep. So yeah, yeah, feel free, uh, anyone listening, to use those jokes. (laughs) (laughs) I've heard the what do you call a dinosaur with a good vocabulary thesaurus before. Me too. (laughs) Next, we've got from Tyrant King, who suggested Barney. Now, Barney is a purple anthropomorphic dinosaur who sings and dances. There's, of course, the I Love You song. Barney's very happy and optimistic, and the series was meant for kids ages 2 to 7, and it aired from 1992 to 2010, which we might have talked about before. But when I was looking it up again, I was surprised again at how long it ran. Yeah. (laughs) It was an okay show. (laughs) (laughs) It was very polarizing. Yeah. And depending on how old you were when it came out, you either loved it or hated it, it seems. Like that Death to Smoochie movie, which I think is basically a reference to Barney. I think so, yeah. (laughs) Now, Barney, probably most of us know, is purple and green, and Barney's a T-Rex. We covered T-Rex back in episode 200, T-Rex Revisited, if you want a lot of details about Tyrannosaurus. In terms of for Barney, they did get some details right, like Barney's got three toes on each foot, and two fingers on each hand, and a large head, and walks on two legs. So that's something. Yeah, that is something. They definitely took some liberties, though, other than, you know, Barney being an English-speaking dinosaur. (laughs) (laughs) The tail drags. Barney eats fruits and vegetables and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. (laughs) And Barney, of course, doesn't have tyrannosaur teeth. He eats bananas. He doesn't have banana-shaped teeth. Uh, Good connection. Yeah. He also doesn't eat the children that surround him. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, also on the show, they've got Triceratops Baby Bob, who's green and wears a pink bow and pink ballet slippers. And there's a Protoceratops BJ, who's yellow and wears a red baseball cap and red sneakers. And the Hadrosaur Riff, who's orange and wears green sneakers. Hmm. Honestly, I remember Riff. I only remember BJ. Yeah. I think me too. I think I was a little bit too old for this show, though. I think those are even less realistic. Yeah, me too. Now, many movies and specials have been made, and at least one game. Like I said, it was very polarizing. People seem to either love or hate Barney. There was a docu-series that came out last year called I Love You, You Hate Me. <laughs> um, I was actually really sad to read about this. Bob West, who was a Barney performer, used to get death threats. Yeah. It's terrible. It's not... I mean, even if you dislike it, you yeah. can just not watch it. Right. And Mattel recently announced that Barney's coming back as a CGI animated series aiming to release next year, 2024. There also might be a live action Barney movie with a supposedly heartbreaking premise, but there's not too many details on that one yet. You can't really do live action Barney unless, I guess if the it's- The show a- was live action, right? You had somebody in a dinosaur <laughs> costume. Yeah, are they going to do that in a movie though? I guess they could. If- Death to Smoochie. That's, That's yeah. true. That was a live action movie, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> the animated series would be funny if they made it like, I've seen some paleo art versions of Barney where it's like a real T-Rex, yeah. but purple and a typical Tyrannosaur killing machine. Oh, I've seen that too. Yeah. <laughs> it could be funny if they did that in CGI. Probably not though. No, I don't think so. I think they keep it kid friendly. It's not really the brand. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, so that's Barney. Then we've got from Croasaur. This one wasn't actually an April Fool's specific suggestion, but I felt like it fit well for this episode. This is uh, any updates on the Chickenosaur since our interview with Jack Horner, which was episode 37. We've got a transcript on our website, and we go into lots of detail with him about the Chickenosaur. Now, I couldn't find too many updates since our interview, But a quick recap, the Chickenosaur project started around 2011. The idea is to retro-engineer chicken embryos so they express hidden traits that make them more like non-avian dinosaurs. So that includes snouts instead of beaks, hands instead of wings, and longer tails. Yeah, basically looking into their DNA and finding these genes that express either a lot of times their proteins or their growth factors that makes you know something either grow teeth or not grow teeth. And if you can find all the right ones, you hope that a chicken still has enough of the DNA of their non-avian dinosaur ancestors that you could flip all those switches on and off as necessary mm-hmm. to make a chicken look just like a dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> and they made, like you said, they made progress. All those things that you listed were things that they actually achieved mm-hmm. other than I think the longer tails they made a snout-like mouth. They gave them teeth. They, I think, changed the hands a little bit, maybe getting rid of some of the wing-like stuff. But the spinal column, I think, was the difficult part for them and making that tail, basically the pygo style turning into like 50 vertebrae of a tail, for example, is tricky. Yeah. So in 2020, Jack Horner tweeted, quote, the Chickenosaurus project is still underway, but we discover that the reduction of the tail from dinosaurs to birds didn't conclude with an atavistic gene, ancestral gene. So we're now trying to understand how the bird tail formed. Once understood, we'll try to reconstruct a dino tail. Okay. So they're still trying, but that one, that might be the one of the sticking points. Could be. Again, he tweeted that in 2020, so about three years ago now. I'm not sure how much further they have to go at this point. But in one interview I found, Horner said that the chickenosaur could happen by 2025, but I do think he said that a while ago. Yeah. There's this joke in like science research where people say it's going to happen in five to 10 years, which is the equivalent of saying it might not ever happen because mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. people don't usually come back 10 years later and say like, no, it didn't happen. <laughs> That's a good point. But a lot of work has been done on the chickenosaur. Yeah. And this was all through the lens of Evo Devo and expressing genes that are already in the DNA. Since the Chickenosaurus project started, CRISPR has advanced quite a bit. And it's possible that we could take some of these tail genes 
from a different reptile or a crocodilian or who knows what, combine it with chicken DNA and really get a more Jurassic Park style mushing different species together to make your dinosaur monster <laughs> strategy. <laughs> And if we do ever have Jurassic Park, that'll be the way that we have it. It's not going to be from, well, probably not going to be from ancient DNA, probably not from mosquitoes and amber kind of thing. It would be from sticking together different genes. Yeah. So very interesting. Doesn't seem like there's too much to update yet. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be big news, though, if they do have an update. Mm -hmm. So some last bits to round out our April Fool's segment here. Going back with our bird connection again, I was thinking about last year's April Fool's Day episode where we talked about the dodo, and we talk about birds a lot too in our first bonus episode of I Know Paleo. It's all about terror birds, so if you want more birds <laughs> yep. and you know other content that will be coming out in the future that isn't strictly dinosaurs, it's I Know Paleo. Have we got the bird for you, the terror bird? <laughs> <laughs> And we'll get on to our Dinosaur of the Day, Ornithomimus, in just a moment. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now on to our Dinosaur of the Day, Ornithomimus, which was a request from PaleoMike716. I chose this one for this week partially because it's a really bird-like dinosaur. And again, last year's episode was very bird-themed. So mm -hmm. we've continued it at least one more year. Ornithomimus was an ornithomimid theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now North America, Canada, and the U.S. It looked somewhat like an ostrich. It walked on two feet. It had a small head. It had a relatively short torso. Its body was covered in feathers, and it had a small, toothless beak. It may have been an omnivore. It had three toes on each foot, long arms, and a long, S-curved neck. Yeah, very ostrich-like. All of those things could be a description of an ostrich. Yeah. Just as much as it could be ornithomimus. Plus the hollow bones, and it was a fast runner. It had large eyes and a large brain. The brain's a little different from an ostrich. <laughs> it probably had good vision, and the large brain may have helped it move fast. It had straight hand and foot claws, and its fingers were about the same in length. The hands looked sloth-like, and Henry Osborne thought that they may have used their hands to hook branches when eating. As sloths do. Yeah. As for size, there's two species of ornithomimus, and they vary a little bit in size. There's the type species ornithomimus velox, and then there's the second species ornithomimus edmontonicus. Gregory Paul in 2010 estimated that ornithomimus Edmontonicus was about 12 feet or 3.8 meters long and weighed 370 pounds or 170 kilograms. Ornithomimus velox was about 20% smaller. The genus name Ornithomimus means bird mimic and it refers to its bird like foot. Charles Marsh named Ornithomimus velox in 1890 based on a foot and part of a hand found in Colorado in the US. The species name velox means swift. When Marsh first described Ornithomimus, he compared it to ostriches and turkeys. Hey, pretty good. Yeah. The fossils were found in 1889 by George Lenman Cannon, and they were found near a small white schoolhouse with chicken coops around it. <laughs> 17 species have been named Ornithomimus, but most of them have been reassigned to another genera or they're considered to be dubious. This happens a lot with dinosaurs named around that time. Yes. Bone Wars. It was all name, 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 name. Oh, most of those were not real. <laughs> well, it, Marsh, in the same paper, he named Ornithomimus velox, named Ornithomimus tenuous and Ornithomimus grandis, based on fragmentary fossils that John Bell Hatcher found in Montana. Grandis, by the way, is now thought to be Tyrannosauroid fossils. <laughs> and tenuous, like tenuously naming. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> And Marsh also named Ornithomimus sedens in 1892 based on part of a foot, and that's now thought to be alvarosaurid material. Lawrence Lamb named Ornithomimus altus in 1902 based on some hind limbs found in Alberta, but this became Struthiomimus in 1916, and we talked about Struthiomimus in episode 270. Yeah, Struthiomimus, that's usually my go-to when I'm trying to think of what an Ornithomimid looked like. Yeah. Especially a big one. And there were a lot of other species name that are no longer valid. I won't read them out, but <laughs> if you want to read them, they'll be in our show notes. Yeah, on our website. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Charles M. Sternberg named the second valid species, Ornithomimus edmontinicus, in 1933, that was based on a nearly complete skeleton found in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation of Alberta, Canada. Oh, so we do have not the holotype being very complete, but another Ornithomimus. Yeah. For years, it was hard to distinguish Ornithomimus from Struthiomimus. Then in 1972, Dale Russell did a study that found the differences between the two and also found Ornithomimus velix and Ornithomimus Edmontinicus to be valid, and then reassigned the other species and created new genera, including Dromesiomimus, which means emu mimic. Struthiomimus, just in case you wanted to know some differences, had a longer torso and longer arms. Russell also said it was hard to tell the difference between Ornithomimus velix and Ornithomimus Edmontinicus. Donald Bard and Jack Horner in 1979 thought that there were two leg bones that were found in New Jersey by Joseph Lady in 1865 to be Ornithomimus, and they named that one Ornithomimus antiquus. <laughs> the antique Ornithomimid. Yeah. <laughs> now, originally those bones were named Coelosaurus antiquus, but Baird and Horner found the name Coelosaurus was already in use for a dubious animal that was named based on one vertebra. That dubious animal was named by an anonymous author in 1854, and we now know that that anonymous author was Richard Owen. Hmm. Donald referred more specimens that were found in New Jersey and Maryland to Ornithomimus antiquus. And then in 1997, Robert Sullivan found Ornithomimus velix and Ornithomimus edmontinicus to be junior synonyms of Ornithomimus antiquus. He found that velix and edmontinicus were difficult to tell apart, and they both shared features with antiquus. But in 2004, David Weishampel found that Ornithomimus antiquus, or Solosaurus antiquus, was a nomum dubium. Yeah, that was surprising. They went back and gave it a species name that predated the other ones, and then they got referred to that species as an unusual way to do it. Yes, and since then, there's been more lumping and splitting, including between Ornithomimus and Dromesiomimus. In 2015, Leon Claysons and Mark Lowen re-described Ornithomimus velox. They fully prepared the holotype. Apparently the holotype wasn't fully prepared before that. Weird. Then they 3D scanned it and did photogrammetry. They wrote, quote, Interestingly, many of Marsh's published drawings of Ornithomimus velox illustrate anatomical detail that was not visible until its recent preparation, and several of the details of these obscured parts in his illustrations are misleading and incorrect, end quote. Good thing they finally prepped it out. Yeah. So the holotype of Velux is likely skeletally mature. They found that Marsh's referred specimen for Velux was also part of the holotype. Turns out it's the same individual. The Ornithomimus Velux foot is more robust than Ornithomimus edmontinicus. Because of its small size, especially compared to other Ornithomimosaurs, they said, quote, Ornithomimus velix may represent the first instance of nanism in this group, end quote. Nanism? Yeah. Meaning being smaller? Yes. Since, yeah, it's, it's smaller than Edmontinicus. Now, four Ornithomimus Edmontinicus specimens have been found with feathers. There were feather imprints found in sandstone. Two of them are adults with traces of feathers on the arms, and one is a juvenile with feather impressions covering the lower back, legs, and neck. Awesome. I don't think I knew that. I didn't either. That we had direct evidence for Ornithomimus having feathers. That's yeah. super cool. It is. And two of the adults have more complex feathers on the arms, which means that the feathers changed as Ornithomimus grew up because the juvenile is covered in filamentous type feathers. The fourth specimen found had feathers along the tail that were crushed and distorted, but it looked really similar to the feathers of an ostrich. And there were also skin impressions, which showed no scales on the mid-thigh to the feet. And there's a flap of skin connecting the torso to the upper thigh. And this is also similar to ostriches. In 2012, there was a study that found Ornithomimus edmontinicus to be covered in feathers at all ages, all growth stages. Hmm. And they found the patterns on the feathers to be similar to ostriches. Well, Marsh nailed it 120 years ago when he said he thought it was like an ostrich. He didn't exactly say he thought it was like an ostrich. He was just comparing what he knew about ostriches and turkeys to okay. Ornithomimus. So based on the feather patterns in the bare skin and the legs being similar to ostriches, for Ornithomimus, they probably used both for thermoregulation. 
Meaning they use their bare skin as well as their feathered parts for thermoregulation? Exactly. Cool. There's more to Ornithomimus than I thought there would be. Very, yeah. Very interesting. So very ostrich-like. <laughs> yeah. And our fun fact of the day is that not all tyrant dinosaurs were huge. The family Tyrannidae is a small fraction of the size of T-Rex. How small? You might be able to see where this is going. Okay. Tyrannidae is a new family of dinosaurs we've never talked about before. I was going to ask because when I first saw it, I thought, is that a typo? <laughs> it is not. It's not Tyrannosauridae, just Tyrannidae. <laughs> They're only found in North and South America. In the rest of the world, they're called Old World Flycatchers. What? Which is a bit of a hint. The common name for Tyrannidae is Tyrant Flycatchers. Okay. And they are, in fact, songbirds. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to be something small when you mentioned the flies. <laughs> that it's bird, yeah. But even though they're songbirds, they can't sing as well as their relatives. However, even though they're not ferocious for mammals, they are quite the tyrants of the sky when you're talking about small flying insects. Mm, watch out, flies. Yes. A large majority of these tyrant flycatchers eat almost exclusively insects, usually mid-air. They are extremely skilled flyers. Many of them use a technique called sallying, and that's where the tyrant flycatcher is standing on a perch. They fly up, snatch an insect out of the air, and then land back down on the exact same perch. Hmm. It's a very slick little move they do. Yeah. And they really are the tyrants over flying insects. They eat not only flies, but mosquitoes, moths, butterflies, flying ants, bees, wasps, grasshoppers, crickets, beetles, weevils, dragonflies, and just about any other living bug that they spot midair. <laughs> wow. Some species also hover over plants to snatch spiders and caterpillars as well. I couldn't find an exact estimate of the number of insects they eat, but similar insectivorous birds eat about a third of their body weight a day. Oh my gosh. Which for the largest flycatchers, that could easily be thousands of flies a day. I can't imagine. That's so many. <laughs> it is. And it explains, we talked, we've talked. we talked about before, we have dinosaurs and birds to thank for the fact that there aren't giant insects today. Because imagine what a, a tasty smorgasbord it would be for these tyrant flycatchers if there were big bugs. They would mm -hmm. eat all of them immediately. They have to evolve to be smaller so the birds can't get all of them. <laughs> <laughs> the smallest species, the pygmy tyrants, weigh as little as four to five grams which is about half the weight of a poker chip, if you need a comparison. It's insane how light some of these birds are. Mm -hmm. And they you know, they still look like a bird. It's not like they're microscopic. Yeah. They're just so fluffy and light and they have the hollow bones and everything. T-Rex reached at least 5,000 kilograms, also known as 5 million grams, which means Tyrannosaurus or Tyrannosauridae weighed about a million times as much as a pygmy tyrant. <laughs> a million <laughs> a million times it's literally a million not that's not a estimation or or an a, exaggeration yeah it's a million times bigger an actual million times the largest of the tyrant flycatchers is the great shrike tyrant they weigh in at 99 grams or a little bit under a quarter pound and they're about the same size as a large blue jay if you've ever seen a blue jay Tyrannosaurus was only about 50,000 times larger than the great Shrike Tyrant. Hmm. Well, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not nearly as impressive, I guess. There is one way that Tyrant Flycatchers are larger than Tyrannosaurus, though, and that's that they are the largest family of dinosaurs in the world, either living or extinct, with over 400 species. Wow. In just the one family. <laughs> How? I didn't know you could have so many. Yeah. Birds are incredibly diverse. Yeah. There's over well over 10,000 species named now, and 400 alone of them are these tyrant flycatchers, which is about a third of the total named dinosaurs. I was going to say, it makes you wonder how many dinosaurs we just don't know about yet. Oh, absolutely. We'll, we will never know about most dinosaurs, and we will never be able to distinguish a lot of the dinosaurs that we have found as unique species when they were, just because it's not in their skeletons. And that's why you got the lumpers and the splitters. Yep. And that wraps up this episode of I Know a Dino. Hope you enjoyed our April tomfoolery. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit extra birdness. Yeah. <laughs> 
stay tuned. Next week, we have a special crossover with the Common Descent podcast, where we'll talk about a little bit more than just dinosaurs. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Good day.